last night's screening was such a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, but it also taught me something about your movie, Jason. I don't know. Did you think about this in the edit that your movie was going to need applause breaks? <laughs> that is the kindest thing you could have said. Look, if you thought it was a thrill for you, you have no idea how big a thrill Comic-Con was for my father and I. McKenna, I have to start with you. Um, I thought yes. you did such an incredible, incredible job of channeling Harold Ramis um, and his physicality. The glasses, I kept watching you push the glasses up. Were there elements of his performances that you saw that you wanted to make sure you included in view? Yeah, well, I mean, of course I, 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 I tried to incorporate Egon Harold Ramis uh, into my performance, but then again, I didn't want to try and imitate something that didn't need to be imitated. You know, uh, I didn't want to try and be Egon as much as uh, Phoebe is a Spangler in the name and in the looks and in the mannerisms, uh, she still, you know, she's still Phoebe. And so it was finding that really cool balance of, of creating Jason and I creating Phoebe together, which we worked really hard on uh, creating Phoebe together and, 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 and incorporating, incorporating, you know, Harold Ramis's performance because it would be a lie if we were like, no, it's totally like nothing like her of Egon. There's definitely something here. But yeah. it, it, she is still her own character, which I think is really special. But Carrie, there's a line <laughs> uh, early in the film that really resonated with me when Finn says to you, um, you're a mom, you live for us. And <laughs> Given her relationship with her dad in this movie, I thought it says a lot about how she raised her own kids. So I was hoping you could sort of talk about conversations you and Jason had about keeping that element of, of Callie explored uh, so it doesn't get lost in what's a ghost comedy, essentially. Right. Well, I think that's uh, I think that says a lot about Jason Reitman as a filmmaker and as a scriptwriter. You know, he and he and Gil wrote the script together and it's um, it's so the relationships in the film are very specific and that's really important um, because of course, yes, it is. It, it's, it's what grounds this film, even though it is a uh, part of this incredible legacy of the, of the Ghostbusters franchise, it, it ultimately has to matter to you what happens to these people. And so I think the writing is so specific and, um, and for Jason to have had this image of this young girl and finally to figure out how she fit into the world of Ghostbusters and then to invite me into it. I love that the center of the story is this, you know, a, a single mom who's broke, you know, who's who's really pretty good at parenting her son, but can't really figure out her daughter. It just feels like a really relatable dynamic. And then you have these extraordinary young actors in Finn and McKenna who are going to be we're going to be watching them act for the next several decades. And I just think it says a lot. It's a testament to Jason's filmmaking that his emphasis was on relationship in, in the film. And um, and so that stuff, you know, it makes you care, hopefully. The props in this film that call back to the original are just perfect. Um, Thank you. From Ecto-1 to the traps. Thank are, you. They are they complete rebuilds? Or were you able to use anything from 84 and 89 that you could sneak uh, into the movie? We were able to get our hands on the 84 props and that was really exciting. We were LIDARing, scanning, everything from uh, the ghost trap. Killer replica. To we had uh, Harold's original proton pack. Uh, we wanted to get everything detail accurate. I mean, when we were rebuilding Ecto-1, uh, we were buying parts from all over the world just to make that thing exactly right. We wanted the whole film to be original recipe Ghostbusters. When you watch this film, you hopefully are transported to what it was like to watch the original back in 84. Egon has a, a fireman's pole in his secret basement lair. And I was wondering yeah. if you think he included that to remind him of his team and his, and, and his friends he left back in New York. Oh yeah, I mean, look, we wanted to have little benchmark moments across the film that brought you back to 84. And that goes right to the opening frames. Even as the, the Columbia logo happens, you are already hearing sound effects and instruments from the original 84 uh, score and sound design that pull you right back into the movie. So you're gonna see all kinds of details from stack books to fire poles, uh, down to just the siren of Ecto-1. Phoebe's very first turn, she blinds uh, somebody with the light. Ah, you <laughs> noticed that. You're the first person to notice that. That's amazing. That's right. That's a total callback. Seeing the original Ghostbusters for the very first time is such a rite of passage. Uh, I'm a father. I couldn't wait till my kids were old enough to finally show it to them. Uh, do you remember the first time you saw it and maybe who showed it to you? Yes, sir. I was three or four years old and my mom just like, she's like, you have to see this movie. So I watched it 
And I remember the library ghost, she scared me so much. I did not like that part. And the movie was really scary for me and really thrilling, but I loved that stuff. Cause at the time I was watching Jurassic Park and you know, that's, that's pretty scary too. Um, and when I grew up, just cause I watched every year, I, uh, I slowly just got all the jokes. I was like, this is such a good movie. Ivan, we have this debate around the Cinema Blend offices a lot when you were making the original ghostbusters did you consider it a comedy that happened to have scares in it or a horror movie that happened to have jokes in it if you were Great putting question. it on the shelf at blockbuster does it belong in comedy or in horror <laughs> look i've mostly made comedy films in terms of my sort of genre so i i have to think of it as a comedy mm. but i really wanted i was a real horror movie fan but when i was 15 years old i had this little a book with you know with all the movies that i'd seen and all kinds of sort of memorabilia that i connected at that point and so i think i came to it um as a fan of horror and you cut your teeth on horror films yeah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. um Finn, I know someone you brought up Stranger Things last night during the the, pe the presentation before the screening, and you almost didn't even want to like acknowledge it. But I love the fact that like both that that and this, they play on nostalgia, but they they also make something new and creative. So what is like? Can you talk a little bit about the balancing act between leaning too hard on nostalgia? Definitely. Versus, I think it relies on story. It relies on on characters that you really love, um, and when you're just throwing stuff out like remember this remember this like south park does a great thing like the member berries like that's yeah, like yeah. brilliant it's like literally like, people just like eat these berries to, like give them nostalgia and like it actually doesn't like do anything it just is like that's it member ghostbusters Ooh, I remember. Remember slimy. and uh i think with nostalgia you're you are walking a fine line on being like kind of lame with it you know what i mean like kind of lame and just like almost a cash grab and uh it has to come from a, a really sincere place. And it, uh, that's why I think Ghostbusters Afterlife is so great is because it, it's a fresh take on it all. Um, and um, I'm lucky to be a part of two things, you know, Stranger Things and Ghostbusters that um, do play on nostalgia, but also have its own characters that live and breathe and yeah. Did you know that, that podcast has its own action figure? Have you seen I the action figure? I did see that, my, um, my mom bought one. <laughs> she did so my, she mom went to tar my mom went to Target and she's like, my son and so she bought one and now we have podcasts at our house i i would never believe that this would ever happen have <laughs> a, my own toy like what is that uh jason what's an existing film of yours that you would love your father to pick up the baton and make a sequel to great uh, question uh i know in my head but before i say if you were to do the sequel to any one of my movies what would it be juno nah, there you go i kind of knew that you'd say that but i want to <laughs> see his young adult it's funny how those initial instincts can be so right. Ivan spent a lot of time on set as well too, uh, right beside Jason. And so I would love for you to just comment on what it was like having him as a resource to be able to tap into, to really get to the, into the lore of the of the story. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was amazing to not only work with Jason, but also have Ivan there, the original creator of this world. And, and um, it, it was really funny because there's a part at the end of the movie that I won't spoil for you guys, but um, I got to do some stunts and and I was kind of surprised at the end because I, I, I didn't know that I had to do this like one one particular part that was like really physical. And and I, I go up to Ivan and he's like, you got this kid. So I go out, I, I do the scene, I come back and he was like, so why are you in school again? <laughs> no, it was just like, that just made me feel so good because he was like, you killed that. It's the sweetest moment. <laughs> That's the best review you could ever get about the performance, I'm sure. Uh, I was hoping you could talk about just the importance of selling those scenes of supernatural exposition uh, and how important they might be as opposed to just finding the laugh in the material. There's a connection that Gary has, McKenna's character, my character has with, with McKenna's, and, and um, they both are interested in science. And they can talk to each other about science um, and connect. One, she's somebody that doesn't connect with a lot of people. I think that he doesn't talk down to kids. I think he's interested in kids who are smart and interesting. And so 
while there's a lot of science talk or explanation that, I, that my character has to say, he's usually saying it with her or with kids. And that's actually building this relationship. And the relationship are interesting. You want to watch them. You want to see them develop. And it's peop and it's like these people connect. And um, and so I don't know. Maybe if 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 that answers the question, I think it's they both <laughs> kind of get a charge out of plate tectonics mm -hmm. and talking about it and <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on. Somehow, a town that isn't anywhere near a tectonic plate is shaking on a daily basis. Did you guys at least get to try on a proton pack? Is there footage of you guys on set just sort of running around with one on? No, I didn't get to try one on, but I uh, I did get to kind of hold one, look at it, and uh, it was off, it was off to the side, and there was no way I wasn't going to go kind of inspect it. How do you not? <laughs> I, right? I didn't dare yeah, pick it yeah. up and put it on. I thought, uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to get kicked off set. <laughs> yeah, it's not your prop, crap, hands you know, off. No, it's not a bad consolation prize. I think we've opened the gates of hell. Hey, have you missed us?